Hello everyone! Thus far in this series we have discussed the ancestors of dinosaurs and the sauropodomorphs. Today we're going to talk about the other major clade of herbivorous dinosaurs. So let's jump right in. <laughs> Ornithischia refers to the hip structure of these dinosaurs. The name means bird-hipped because their pubis is pointed backwards, much like in birds, though that superficial similarity threw scientists off for a while. These dinosaurs are not closely related to birds, while it turned out that the Sorisciian theropods that birds did evolve from had developed that specific pelvic structure independently. Another feature Ornithischians share is the predentary bone, which juts out from the bottom jaw. This feature caused paleontologist Othniel Charles Marsh to suggest that the Ornithischians should be renamed Predentata, but this obviously never became widely accepted. And all Ornithischians have leaf-shaped teeth, which help them grind plants in a way their peg-toothed Sorisciian cousins couldn't. In addition to these teeth, the herbivorous Ornithischians developed another adaptation over time, a large gut. You see, herbivores need large guts to digest cellulose, so instead of extending their intestines out to the sides like cows and sauropods, who are both quadrupedal, Ornithischians extended their intestines backwards. As the gut moved backwards, the pubis also moved back. This allowed the Ornithischians to keep their center of mass close to the hips so they could remain at least facultatively bipedal. The Ornithischians who became secondarily quadrupedal did so because of their heavy armor, such as stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. In the video Dinosaur Ancestors, we pointed out Eocursor from the late Triassic, being one of the earliest Ornithischians yet found. It's a small bipedal animal, and Ornithischians kept that basic trend into the Jurassic. While sauropodomorphs were attaining large sizes early on, Ornithischians scurried about under their feet on the forest floor. An early and successful clade of Ornithischians is Heterodontosauridae, which appeared in the early Jurassic and lasted all the way into the early Cretaceous. As an early offshoot of the Ornithischian clade, members of this group had really odd characteristics. They were obligate bipeds, and their unique dentition included large canine-like tusks and cheek teeth for chewing, which indicates that they could have been omnivores. One Heterodontosaurid, Tianulong, is especially intriguing in that it was covered in filamentous and tegumentary structures that bear some resemblance to the protofeathers of theropod Cynosauropteryx. At present, it is unknown whether homology or convergence explains this resemblance. Next, we come to the glade Genosauria, who are identified at least in part by their deep-set tooth rows positioned away from the sides of the face, and it includes the most famous Ornithischians. This clade is split into Thyreophora and Neornithischia. At the base of Genosauria lies another primitive bipedal Ornithischian called Lesothosaurus. The exact position of this dinosaur is still uncertain, from being an early Neornithischian, an early Thyreophoran, or basal to both. In all cases, it is very close to the initial split, which means that the common ancestor would have looked a lot like Lesothosaurus. Thyreophora includes the famous Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus, but the earliest members of this clade don't really look like either big surprise. Instead of being lumbering, tank-like quadrupeds, the first Thyreophorans were facultative bipeds, such as Scutellosaurus, Emosaurus, and Scalitosaurus. They had armor scutes adorning their back, but no tail spikes or clubs. Following these basal forms, Thyreophora splits into Stegosauria and Ankylosauria. Stegosaurs are well known for their impressive dorsal plates, and these plates likely served multiple functions. Originally probably used solely for armor, the diversification of Stegosaurs in the Middle and Late Jurassic led to the innovation of defensive tail spikes, which are probably modified armor scoots, called Thagomizers. The term was actually coined by a cartoonist as a joke, but it still became widely adopted. Who said paleontologists don't have any sense of humor? Because stegosaurs relied solely on their thagomizers for defense, the other armor scoots were free to be modified for a different function. Those armor scoots became the dorsal plates, which might have been used for species recognition. 
Another popular hypothesis is that they were used to some extent in thermoregulation, although this is unlikely to have been their primary function. Regardless, the earliest evidence of stegosaurs comes from the middle Jurassic ichnogenus deltapodus, which is just a few dermal tail spines. After that, Hoyangosaurus is currently the oldest known genus and bears some primitive features, including a skull broader than later forms, which indicated that it was not as adapted for selective feeding, and teeth in the premaxilla. The same formation that produced Hoyangosaurus also evidently produced Chunkingosaurus, Gigantspinosaurus, and Tuojingosaurus, so Middle Jurassic China clearly had conditions conducive to producing small stegosaurs. Stegosaurs had their heyday in the late Jurassic, becoming dispersed throughout North America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. It's from this time period that Stegosaurus hails as well as Kentrosaurus, Dacentrurus, Hesperosaurus, and Miragaya. The last Stegosaurus straggled into the early Cretaceous, such as Werasaurus, before finally going extinct. Now on the other side of the Thyreophoran divide is the Ankylosaurs. Unlike Stegosaurs, the Ankylosaurs got their start in the late Jurassic, showing up in forms like Mimoropelta and Gargoylosaurus. While the Stegosaurs erected dorsal plates out of their earlier bony scutes and only used the Thagomizers for defense, the Ankylosaurs used almost all of their dermal armor for this purpose as they mostly rounded and flattened theirs. Some Ankylosaurs even sported shoulder spikes, such as Edmontonia. With an Ankylosauria, the tree splits into Notosauridae and Ankylosauridae. Notosaurids are distinguished by having no tail club, while Ankylosaurids do. There is one exceptional specimen of a Notosaur called Borelopelta that was discovered in 2017 by accident by a miner. It's one of the best preserved dinosaur fossils of its size, and its skin even contains pigments that indicate countershading. Even though these dinosaurs were built like tanks, they still relied on camouflage to avoid predation. Ankylosaurs reached their peak in the Cretaceous with forms like Ankylosaurus from North America and Pinacosaurus from China and Mongolia. Both of these lived in environments home to monstrous tyrannosaurids, but the sheer amount of bone protecting the herbivores and camouflage was probably enough to protect it against most carnivores. Despite their biodiversity, the ankylosaurs were completely wiped out by the meteoric impact at the end of the Cretaceous. Finally, we turn to the other branch of Genosauria, Neornithischia. The earliest members of this clade were, unsurprisingly, small bipeds, such as Agilosaurus and Hexenlusaurus. After that, the remaining members are grouped into either Ornithopoda or Marginocephalia. Ornithopods never developed armor or defensive strategies apart from thumb spikes, but they were facultative bipeds who could run on two legs. So they likely relied more on speed and agility to outrun the predators. One of the most basal members of ornithopods is Gideon Mantelia from early Cretaceous Spain. Most of the remaining ornithopods are then classed in Iguanodontia, of which Rhabdodontidae is a basal family. After Tenontosaurus and Dryosauridae, we come to the clade Ankylopelexia, which contains such members as Camptosaurus, Oranosaurus, and the well-known Iguanodon. The famous Hadrosaurids evolved out of this clade as well from Iguanodont-like species such as Equijubus. Hadrosaurids were the most diverse and specialized branch of ornithopods. The crucial factor to their success was the unique way they chewed their food. Hadrosaurids developed a dental battery composed of thousands of interlocking teeth, forming a grinding surface that was continually replaced as it wore down. Not only that, hadrosaurids had hinges between the upper jaw and the rest of the skull. This made the upper jaw rotate outward as the teeth of the lower jaw pushed against the upper teeth. This method of mastication is called pleurokinesis, and this made hadrosaurids some of the most efficient herbivorous amniotes that ever lived. In the late Cretaceous, an array of crested forms appeared including Parasaurolophus, Corythosaurus, Lambiosaurus, Oloratitan, and others. It seems in the case of Parasaurolophus that they were able to use their elongate crest for sound production, and it also possibly functioned in species recognition. And like the ankylosaurs, the ornithopods went extinct during the KT extinction event. Finally, we reach the last clade of Ornithischians, Marginocephalia. This clade includes Ceratopsia and Pachycephalosauria, but we covered the evolution of Ceratopsians in Paleogeography, thus we are going to move straight to the Pachycephalosaurs. 
The basal ceratopsians and pachycephalosaurs both look a lot alike, such as Yinlong and Wananosaurus, being small bipeds with a bony shelf at the back of the skull, showing that these two only recently diverged from each other. As we saw, ceratopsians evolved into large quadrupeds with horns and frills, but pachycephalosaurs didn't go this route. Instead, they evolved a dome. Currently, all pachycephalosaurs are known from the late Cretaceous of North America and Asia, but their ancestry must extend all the way back into the late Jurassic. It was thought that there was a large number of pachycephalosaur genera roaming North America all at the same time, but evidently several of these turned out to be the same species at different periods in their ontogeny. And, like all the other non-avian dinosaurs, they met their end at the close of the Cretaceous. So, we see that the Ornithischians were a highly diverse clade of dinosaurs. The group produced large and small herbivores, quadrupeds and bipeds, armored and horned grazers, and more, with different groups evolving unique methods to consume plant matter and defending against the co-evolving carnivorous dinosaurs. In the next video, we will take a look at the last major clade of dinosaurs, the theropods. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.